Good evening, everybody. And um, welcome to the Mental Health Professionals Network webinar tonight, working collaboratively to support the social and emotional well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth in crisis. Currently, we have 550 uh, participants logged in, which is fantastic. Um, we're very pleased to have you all. And I've noticed that we have people from lots of rural and remote places tonight. Kununurra, Alice Springs, Nulimboy, Mount Gambia, welcome. And I'm also very pleased that um, myself and two of the panellists are from far north Queensland. So I feel that we're well represented tonight. Um, MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the Elders, past, present and future, for the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'm Mary Emelais and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Um, my background is in general practice and I have a Masters in Psychotherapy. So I've mainly been working in sort of special interest primary care mental health for about 15 years. Most all in far north Queensland. I do a bit of medical education teaching GP registrars and I've actually just commenced psychiatry training. So I've been really pleased to meet Marshall through this process. Um, you were provided with the uh, biographies of our panellists along with the webinar invitation. Um, and I hope that you've had a chance to read them. So I'd like to introduce our panellists before we get going. Um, just before we talk to Lewis, so Lewis is in Atherton on the, uh, on the Atherton Tablelands in Far North Queensland. There's a bit of a buzz on his phone, which we think just might be due to um, his location, and we can't do much about it. So if you notice a buzz when Lewis is on the phone, um, please just acknowledge this is one of the limitations of rural Australia. Um, so Lewis is a Gitome man from the Jirabalagan language group, which is the rainforest people of North Queensland. He's a senior medical officer at the Atherton District Hospital, and I for the um, non-medical people in the audience. He, he's a rural generalist doctor, so he, he does everything. He's kind of the old-fashioned bush doctor. I hope Lewis will clarify that if I've got that wrong. Um, at the Atherton District Hospital, and he, he is a rural generalist. Lewis was actually the founding president of the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, and he's been directly involved in health advocacy for Indigenous Australians for more than a quarter of a century, and has served on numerous federal and state health committees and reference groups throughout his career. Lewis, I noticed that um, on the photo that you've sent us, you have your children. And I wondered whether there was a particular reason why you provided us with this lovely picture. Um, ultimately, it's a quick way of uh, letting everybody know that I've got skin in the game. Um, um, those are, those, those are my, my daughters. Um, and ultimately, um, I want to see that uh, that we try and make the better the world a slightly better place for them and for their journey through it. Um, uh, for Aboriginal people, there's still an awful lot of difficulties um, um, that we experience, um, and um, and so anything anything that uh, uh, that lifts the boat for um, for Aboriginal people lifts the boat for my children. Which is fantastic, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you. Then I'd like to introduce Marshall, since his camera's there. Um, so Marshall is an Aboriginal man and a descendant from the Noongar people, which is in southwest Western Australia. He is a child and adolescent forensic psychiatrist in South Australia and sits on the Youth Justice Board of Western Australia and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Advisory Group. So it's fantastic to have um, someone with Marshall's knowledge and experience on this panel. Lots of the questions from the audience have been around these sort of things. So, um, and professionally, Marshall's interests include complex childhood trauma and offending, aggression and violence, and juvenile sex offenders and problematic offending behaviours. So, um, Marshall, could you tell us a bit more about the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Advisory Group? What are they trying to do? Well, the, I mean, the overarching aim of the actual group is to provide the Federal Minister for Health and Aboriginal Affairs about advice that's gleaned from sort of community members across the country working in various areas and people on the ground about how to improve social and emotional wellbeing and mental health 
for our people um, and also to reduce suicide rates as well. Um, it's at the federal level but looks at locally based solutions appreciating that you know it's not a one size fits all approach and what works for one community may not work for another but also drawing upon not just sort of clinical knowledge and expertise but also interweaving sort of cultural practices and local practices within that as well. Um, you know, suicide prevention is a very complicated and challenging area because people present generally end stage or in crisis across the board for Aboriginal people and sadly um, too late sometimes for, for our people. And I don't think that the Western approaches are actually flawed but it's because suicide prevention itself is actually quite complex. But the solutions aren't really based on one evidence base or one sort of illness pattern. It's not just depression that results in suicide. From an Indigenous perspective, it's the ongoing impact of colonisation. Um, but more contemporarily, there's loss, grief, trauma, and often more, more importantly, but mentioned but not really understood is this construct of shame and how powerful that actually can be. Um, so the goals really are to look at the mental health and social well-being as they relate to Indigenous people, but also ways to address them as well. Thanks, Marshall. It's great to have you. And I'd like to finally introduce Jeff Nelson. Jeff's a clinical psychologist um, working in North Queensland in private practice. Uh, and also he does a lot of work in boarding schools that cater specifically for Indigenous students and with men in the correctional services system. Jeff is also an Aboriginal man and he's from Cairns, working predominantly with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. But I must say, um, not exclusively, because I'm a GP and I'm able to refer to Jeff and he also does great work with white fellas too. Uh, his focus is on working with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cohort, um, which has allowed the development, in his opinion, of a range of effective strategies that target emotional regulation and positive decision making in environments that are sometimes stubbornly resistant to change. A majority of his work in schools uses uh, assessment, and he's talking about psychological assessment, which he'll explain more, to inform systems and family-based intervention with the intention to provide the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people um, with equitable access to opportunities so that they can enjoy positive life outcomes. Jeff, um, I'm wondering why you chose to work in private practice. Um, I suppose, Mary, the history was that I sort of worked beside big bureaucracies and um, I probably didn't do that very well. And one thing I noticed was that, you know, our mob have got a lot of high complex needs and as far as access to services, I thought it was quite low. So what I did was move away from the big machine and into a much smaller machine and do what I could to, um, you know, work with one-on-one -on -one to start with and then into the schools and more generally to bring the idea that we bring we bring best practice to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and work with our people. We don't, and I, I, I have a lot to say and you'll hear this during the, this webinar that I don't think we do any great magic. We just work with our with our mob, and it works most of the time. So that's why I went away from the big machine, virtually. Well, it's great to have you here as a as a private practitioner, as as well as being an Aboriginal person, um, because we do have a lot of private practitioners in our audience. And remembering that MHPN is around um, how we how we collaborate across the different sectors. So it's it's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to quickly run through the ground rules. So um, just remembering that um, if you're operating in the general chat box, so you can put comments or questions for the panellists. Um, just remember it is a public space, so behave as if it were a face-to-face -face activity. If you need help with technical issues, there's a technical help chat box and remembering that everything can be seen. So um, it is a professional development activity, so all the comments should be related to what we're talking about. Now some people may find the chat box quite distracting, in which case you can hide it. So there's a small down arrow at the top of the chat box. When we finish, we have an, a short exit survey, which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. And your feedback's really important to us, and uh, it helps us inform um, improvements and, what, and ideas for future webinars. This um, 
webinar is a little bit different to our usual format. So we're not having a case study, which you may have noticed. Um, what we're going to be doing is having questions and answers between the panellists, but also keeping a close eye on what you would like to talk about. And we have noted the um, themes from the questions that you submitted prior to the webinar when you registered. Just remembering that um, there are now 635 people online and over 2,000 people registered. So we had a lot of questions. So please don't be offended if your question doesn't get answered. Um, and I'm just going to have a look, remind you of the learning outcomes. So we are keeping in mind um, the reality of youth suicide in this group. And we'll be having also a kind of general conversation about how we work effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people. So we're looking at implementing the key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth experiencing psychological distress. How do we identify them? How do we help? Um, develop appropriate referral pathways to prevent crisis and provide early intervention. And identify challenges, tips and strategies to implement a collaborative response to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth in crisis. Now, I would like to mention that there is a resources box down in the bottom right-hand corner. It looks like a little folder. And in there, um, you'll find some resources that um, the panelists sub submitted beforehand. Uh, and Marshall has um, a, a slide presentation in there, which he won't be showing on this screen, but is there as a reference point. So if you happen to be able to download it onto your computer or double screen, there may be times when he might refer to one of those slides, but otherwise just make a note and have a look at them afterwards. Um, so I think without further ado, we might get on with having a conversation. So I'm going to actually ask Lewis the first question because it's the one that has come in the most from the, um, the audience as well. So people want to know what, what do we need to do differently with, uh, when we're working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, around engagement, getting on well, being effective counsellors and clinicians? So we kind of have this idea that there must, there must be some special techniques or um, ways of working. And Lewis, I know you've, you've got some really helpful things to say about this. Well, I I think I think the the main trick is actually there is no there is no magic trick to it at all. Um, uh, in conversations that we had before this, I made the point that this is um, almost the, the same as uh, Shylock's speech from um, um, from Merchant of Venice, you know, where he says, uh, "I'm a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means." warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? I think one of the, one of the big mythologies that we have um, uh, when it comes to, to any form of health care, uh, mental or physical health care, uh, among diverse, uh, diverse um, patient groups, um, is the idea that we, uh, we have a system that works really, really well um, for, uh, for white people. And if we just do the little crossover course, um, then we'd be able to get to, to work well for, um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or any other um, ethnic group. And I think the reality is that um, a, a, lot of, a lot of what we do from day to day uh, may not be quite as effective as, as we think. Um, and the thing that is most effective is actually dealing with the person in front of you at their point of need, um, whoever or whatever they are. Um, um, trying to, to make sure that the tone of your conversation um, uh, is something that they're going to best comprehend when you ask questions, that you ask questions um, which are going to make some sense to them and they can see context of those questions and then you know, the chance of them answering the question goes up by a factor of 10. Um, uh, and, and a whole bunch of those, those incredibly simple things about just communicating with other people. Um, and, and I think that the, it's a big mistake that people make to think that Aboriginal people are, are markedly different um, um, in that regard. And, and really, uh, you know, we're, we're not. Yes, there'll be some, some, uh, some cultural considerations 
um, but I think that this is true of almost any group that you that you're going to communicate with. Um, uh, and you know, if you just move to a different town from where you are now, if you move to a different state, um, then even if even if the ethnicity of the of the uh, your patient group is not much different than what it is now, you're still going to find that there are significant cultural differences. Um, you know, because culture is those things around us that that help uh, help you know explain the world um, as we perceive it. Um, so the, the 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 big trick is actually that there is no trick. And, um, and you know, if you start by treating that other person like a human being um, and, uh, and, you know, good old golden rule stuff, you know, what's over you with that men should do you, um, then I think you'll get through an awful lot of that stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, I think Aboriginal people, by and large, are used to the idea that, um, that, a lot of, that white fellas will get things wrong from time to time. White fellas will make some social faux pas. I think we tend to expect it. Um, um, and um, and as long as you know, w when we know that the intent is good, then um, then the minor sins can easily be forgiven. Thank you, Lewis. It's really, I, I always really enjoy talking to you, um, and I, I'm always impressed with your you know knowledge of literature and all sorts of things as well. I, I think our metaphors and and artistic language sometimes very often express things that we just can't put into PowerPoint presentations. Um, Jeff, on that on that note of um, you know that that we need to just be treating it, everybody with respect and, and everybody the same. I know that there, there's a lot of um, in some circles reluctant reluctance to use things like um, psychological testing instruments or because they haven't been validated for youth with Indigenous populations. And I know you've got some, some thoughts about that. So I wondered if you'd like to come in. Um, yes, Mary, I will. Look, I've, um, over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of assessment within schools in the Cape, uh, the north of the, end of the Northern Territory and through to Kimberley and Pilbara. And I've been using psychometric instruments that some would argue that you shouldn't be using um, and the thing is the reasons for saying that the tests are unsuitable or will provide invalid results are very very hollow. They'll say that you know, number one English second language but then in Australia we have a lot of people in English second language they'll say that you know cultural effects on the way people think there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to sort of discount the value of actually using validated established tests. Um, I very much argue against this, and, and the reason I do is that if you actually run through the tests and you get scores, you sit with kids, you sit with family, you sit in community, you see the way kids are behaving. You know, you, you'll know when a 12-year-old is acting like someone very much younger. That says to me that there's something positive going on here and what we actually do with some of these assessments is that we can actually um, gather further resources so that schools have a, a better opportunity to provide you know the best chance of a great education so um, I've had this argument probably at least once a week for the last two years and I probably will for the, for the remainder of my time but the thing is we do everything in a certain way and it's interesting Mary this webinar in the fact that you've got three Aboriginal men um, who work with Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and we're talking about how we work and potentially talking about how non-Indigenous people should work now we've never been non-Indigenous so I don't know whether what we're going to say is truly accepted by everyone but look we will do what we do. We're doing really good work with kids up here. Um, kids are getting a lot of benefit out of it. I see that for myself, and that's not because I do it. Um, so until we get to a stage where I think that what our current practices are not effective, um, we'll continue, or I'll continue doing what I'm doing. And I, I suppose there's, there's also, um, you know, historically this assumption of um, a sort of homogeneity around Aboriginality as well that 
there must be one Aboriginal opinion about all sorts of things. And, and clearly that's not true. And so I don't expect the three of you to all agree on everything either necessarily. Um, and I wanted to bring um, Marshall in. So Marshall, you're actually a psychiatrist. So one of the things that you get trained in and, and examined on to become a psychiatrist is psychiatric diagnosis. And we use predominantly the DSM in Australia. And I, I wondered how relevant that is for working with the young people who you work with who have like uh, complex trauma and, and, and so much complexity in their lives. How, how do you work in a system that requires the DSM or is it useful? Yeah, I think the DSM is useful to a point, but I think you've got to, you know, and I think it is relevant, but it's a manual and not of, you know, not of how to do things, but what to actually look for. And if you sort of think, the, the, the risk is that you, you see something and you categorise it and you put it into a, you know, an, an illness pattern. But, you know, if you take a step back, dis-ease is, is around impairment and not being able to do stuff and really what's going on there and so forth and so on. And where people get stuck is that, you know, certain diagnoses associated with issues of stigma being devalued, personal experience and so forth. And the issue is that stigma is compounded by institutional racism, which is alive and well with a lack of respect of cultural practice. The thing with kids is kids are work in progress or a transition. So not everything's going to fit into a diagnostic category and that's okay. You don't have to have a diagnosis. It's okay to sit with the uncertainty as long as you can sit there and call it that. There's nothing wrong with having a bit of this or a bit of that. It doesn't mean to say you don't want to be talking about it. It's just appreciating the fluidity of child development, the fact that things change and also that kids' lives occur in context. Um, the thing about the DSM for Aboriginal people is DSM hasn't caught up with us yet. You know, the, the, there's lots of stuff in there around early childhood trauma and development and, you know, PTSD in kids, but it's very, very narrow. And what we see are loss, grief and trauma. It manifests differently in kids and versus teenagers versus adults. But predominantly what also we have issues are is shame, guilt, identity formation, lack of feeling valued, all of that stuff doesn't fit into a category. So the categories are useful to a point, especially useful medical legally when you have to communicate with people and professionals and so forth. But to sit there and give someone a diagnosis, it can be stigmatising, but it can also be quite validating for some people and giving, give them something tangible, just something that feels very, very nebulous. And I think just as it's okay to, to not to have a diagnosis, it's also useful to have one, and it varies between people as well. The thing is not to put all your eggs in one basket and just appreciate the fact that, look, kids change, stuff changes, and that's okay, but as long as you are making, you're making progress and getting traction and trying to help get people out of whatever they're in, the space they're in, and then that's what you're aiming to be doing. Mm. And I, I, just to let the audience know, of whom there are 665 now, um, we haven't been able to upload Marshall's slides yet, but you will get them by the end or after the webinar. So um, apologies about that. Marshall, I know that one of the things that you you notice in the clients who you work with, um, despite very adverse circumstances and um, trauma and you know involvement with the forensic system and so on, one of the things you emphasise is finding um, their strengths and their resilience. Yeah. What you know? What do you look for? How do we how do we look for that? Looking at it is just sitting with someone in their space and looking and trying to really get an idea of who they are as a person, the context of their life circumstances. We know that, you know, when they come to a forensic, you know, if they come into in custody or whatever, we know they're a high risk. I don't need anything to tell me that. I know that because of the, the you know, how they've come to be there and their, and their circumstances. And it's really just about being human. It's about sitting with someone in the, and meeting them in the space that they're actually in and just trying to see the world through their eyes. And then from there, you can look at people's strength. And, you know, looking at, you know, tapping into things like, you know, what are kids interested in? What are you good at? What makes you happy? What makes you proud? What do you like to do? You know, it doesn't always have to be issues of academic performance and so forth and so on. And I've seen so many kids labelled as a bad nerdy kid, but when you sit there and appreciate the context of their lives, behaviour is a form of communication. Um, and if you don't actually appreciate the behaviour for what it actually is, the narrative behind it, you're missing it. And it's where the narrative, when you actually understand the narrative and appreciate the narrative, that's when you start to see the strength of people. Because what they can do is yarn a good story about their life 
and that's the life, the life narrative is what you tap into. And you want to move, you know, they're obviously going on a narrative that is, you know, they're on a, a, a narrative story or a narrative cycle, I guess, in a way that, that's got them to where they are now. So the, the, the issue is about how do you tap into the resilience in them and the strength in them is to get them onto an alternative narrative. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But uh, Lewis, I, I know that you also work, um, do some work in the prison, and I just wondered what what that experience has taught you. I know you've got a bit of a yarn for us about that that I think would be great at this point. Um, yeah, so there's a prison not far from here, and, and, uh, and I do a regular clinic there. Um, and uh, I think the, the sad thing for me um, is um, uh, how many of these guys are there for for the for what's ultimately silly reasons. So and and for for a lot of these men, they will they will get intoxicated. While they're intoxicated, they do something silly. Um, um, you know, these guys aren't robbing banks. Um, not not many of them have actually been charged with insider trading. Um, uh, you know, they're mostly mostly they're just getting drunk and doing something stupid. Um, and then they're ending up in prison for it. And the problem, is that one of the awful things that you see with the young people coming through is, is this acceptance that this is the world that they live in. Um, uh, the, just when I was a, a young fellow myself, just um, um, in the first couple of years, or actually before I started medical school, I was working on my tribal property down near Tully, um, and uh, my father was actually managing the, um, the, the farm. As a local headmaster uh, came to us, he'd managed to get some extra funding for the primary school um, to get a groundsman, and he was hoping to be able to employ an Aboriginal man in that position. And so he came to us and, you know, asked the questions, oh, do you have somebody here who will be good at um, looking after the lawns? Yeah, 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 no problem. Um, you know, they need to be good with kids. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. They need to be reliable and turn up to work all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. They'll need to be good at uh, fixing engines and stuff because if there's a, you know, they'll need to be able to do basic maintenance and repairs on the on the mines. Yeah, 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 no problem. You know, he had this long list of things and, and yeah, no problem, we could fill that. And the last question he asked was, oh, oh and by the way, um, um, no criminal record. Oh, oh, what, recently oh, or at all? Um, and um, and the, the intriguing thing is that I was the, the only Aboriginal man um, um, on that property who didn't have a criminal record for some one or other reason. We, we managed to give Uncle Claude um, the position because uh, it had been some years since he'd been arrested for um, breathing while black um, and, um, and the computer systems among the police were not all that good back those days and so they weren't able to track him and because he hadn't had a recent conviction then, um, then he slipped through the police check okay. Um, but there was this incredible normalisation um, of, of that, that prison is, 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 is a virtual rite of passage. Um, and, um, and anything that we can do to start trying um, to, to get through to these young guys as they, as they have some engagement with health systems or, or police systems or you know, the justice system, that actually this, they're not irrevocably set down this path um, is, um, uh, is, you know, that, that's the thing that hopefully will, will change lives. And I mean, we only get the change in one at a time, um, um, but, that's, you know, but that's good enough. And, and if you can get one of these kids to just stay out of prison, um, then the opportunities that they have in life um, are magnificently greater than they otherwise would have been. Um, and uh, certainly we, we have this story over and over again with um, uh, Aboriginal medical services giving, uh, delivering services inside prisons um, and invariably they'll have an issue with the, um, with the male Aboriginal health workers, um, uh, many of whom will have had a criminal conviction, again, usually for something that's pretty ridiculous, um, but nevertheless they'll have a criminal conviction and they've got to get all sorts of exemptions made so that this, this, Aboriginal, this male Aboriginal health worker can now actually attend to Aboriginal men within the prison system, um, uh, and you know it's just it is it's just so distressing that, um, that this experience has become so normalised. Um, you know, as Aboriginal as Aboriginal men, we're we're 15 times um, more likely to do time than than you know the average pelican out there, um, and um, you know, and that's a fair bit actually. Mm. And. 
Lewis, I, I remember having a conversation with you actually the first time I met you about um, about you know when we grow up we think that our experience is normal and I remember you telling me about um, something that happened with when, when, when you were a medical student and, and realising that, that not everybody grew up automatically going into a room and looking for threat weapons and oh, exits. Yes, when I, it would have been when I was in third year third year medicine um, and um, and so with the, we were doing a country term uh, this was at uh, Tamworth um, uh, went to the to the workmen's club um, with the with the um, um, group of medical students that were that were my rural group Lo lovely people lovely kids um, um, we were having a good time um, uh, having a bit of a dance and uh, a couple of intoxicated boys on the side of the room um, decided to start crashing into myself and uh, the young lass that I was dancing with. And, you know, that was uh, extremely humorous for the first half dozen times or so. Then it started to get a little tedious. Um, um, you could see that the guy who was the leader of the pack was uh, standing on the sidelines. Um, and I went over and I just said, oh, look, uh, you know, brother, it was uh, extremely humorous the first dozen or so times, but would you mind calling the boys off because it's just getting a bit tiresome now. Um, um, the young lady that I was with, the member of my group, um, then uh, put herself between uh, between us because apparently putting a, a pile of oestrogen in between two lumps of testosterone cools everything down, apparently. Not, not in the world I come from, but maybe it does in theirs. And, um, and, but, you know, everything all petered out. On the way back um, uh, to, the, to the hospital accommodation, these guys were just into me about, oh, you didn't know what you're doing, and... Anyway, I was quite bewildered. I didn't understand what they were so concerned about. And um, one of the guys in the group, Gary, who was, uh, he'd spent 10 years in the Army before coming into medical school, um, a fa fairly worldly wise white boy from the western suburbs of Sydney, and I was talking to, to Gary because I, I didn't understand what these guys were so upset about. And, um, and then he explained to me that, oh, well, they, the, that this, is, you know, th this whole thing is, a, is an environment that's unfamiliar to them. And I said, well, I don't know what the danger was. I, you know, I knew who the threats were, I knew who the leader of the pack was, I knew which order that I needed to take him out in, I knew where the weapons were, there was, there was a couple of bottles on the table to my right, um, and there was a few chairs, and I had um, uh, two main exits um, to the left-hand side, so I knew, you know, how to defend myself, who to take out, and how to get out of there. I, I, I don't understand it. Anyway, and he had this long conversation with me, where, where for the first time it had, it, I, it had, then, it had dawned on me that these middle-class white kids um, um, have never had to do that, that they've never had to walk into a room and scan for threats, weapons and exits. Um, and uh, so when I was 21 years of age at the time, and it was just I could not comprehend the idea um, because I had never entered a room in, in my conscious memory that I hadn't done a scan of threats, weapons and exits. It's, it's the first thing you do. Even my daughters who, who have grown up in a much kinder um, environment than, than I did, um, they know that the first thing you do is scan for threats, weapons, and exits. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and it was just oh, don't get me wrong. I I really hope that my grandkids are able to grow up in a world where they don't need to do that anymore. That'd be fantastic. But um, um, but there is just a it's a it is a different worldview. Um, and um, and one of those I think one of the really interesting things when you look at the, at stressors for young Indigenous people. When I was in Headspace, this was a uh, an issue that came up at times, and one of the interesting things to, to, to get through to people is that the you know the the, the top ten stressors um, for your average um, middle class um, non indigenous Australian child um, uh, probably wouldn't make the top uh, you know uh, anywhere in the top hundred of the major stressors that that um, that you know that that rural based Aboriginal child um, would undertake in their life, um, and that the you know, the, whereas whereas that, that middle class kid might be concerned about whether or not they they um, you know who who what subjects they're going to be taught at school tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the Aboriginal kids might wonder if they will get fed before they go to school tomorrow. Um, you know, just yeah. and and there there is that 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 different experience. But I think once you can appreciate that just a little bit, um, um, then I think the the that. It doesn't take long for the communication barriers um, um, to break down. And when you're talking to somebody, it's, if you have the ability to peel back in your own head 
um, uh, you know, things that I do because I'm a human as opposed to things that I do um, because it's the culture in which I was raised. Um, um, you know, shaking hands and saying good day, um, that's not a human thing, that's a cultural thing. Um, um, uh, having a form of greeting, that's a human thing. If, yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, and I can see that the, um, the audience is really getting a lot from what you're saying too. And I'd like to bring Jeff in now. So Jeff, um, you know, I think we have an understanding that, that, that the young people that we're going to meet in this line of work often do have really complex stories. And I wonder how you begin. You know, when you first are working with a young person in your very first session, what are the kinds of things that you do, keeping in mind that at this mo moment you don't really know anything about them? Um, well, there's probably two, two parts of this. And if I forget the second part, Mary, bring me back to it. But Okay. If, if I look at a normal everyday first session now, a lot of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids and adults are referred to me because I'm an Aboriginal man. And so automatically there's a, a sense of comfort to one level. But they, a lot of the mob here don't know me, so we start at the beginning. Um, the clinic I work in is brightly coloured. I don't believe in having white walls and white roofs. That's not for me. Um, they have a choice. There's a yellow clinic room, there's a green, very nice green, and a blue. I say, which one do you want? You, you take your pick, go into a room. I, I'm not a big believer in the whole session. The psychology talks about the first session, first one and a half sessions being a you know information collection assessment piece. Um, I've got clients who are very, very tentative about being anywhere near a psychologist. So for me, my first session is 70% working with your client, 30% hoping that you'll provide something so your client's keen to come back. So we start with the story. I move quickly to, well, you know, in the ideal world, what, what would be a great outcome of this? And I always work with whiteboards. I've got whiteboards in every room. I've got whiteboards everywhere. Um, and I'm very, very keen to get my clients off, off their feet, or up onto their feet, and engaging, so behaviourally. So we'll start on a whiteboard, you know, within a short time I'll be throwing a whiteboard marker at my client saying, come on, let's let's do this. And once you get them up and moving around, it's a really, really good thing. I get a lot of the story. I see, I, I get to the end of the first session and, you know, it's always about, well, you know, what are we going to do together? So if we're going to go in a particular direction, what is it? And I'm always big about, well, it's not, it's not about what we're, we're moving away from, it's what we're moving towards. So it becomes a, a joint mission, so to speak. Um, and there's a whiteboard that's full of horrible stuff because I, my drawing capacity is zero, my writing is very, very poor. Maybe I should have been a medical doctor. But um, and I'll do that with my male clients and my female clients, um, and it works. I mean, I'm very happy to say that my clients do come back and we go into some really, really difficult spaces and they can sit with the difficult space and we can work through things. Yeah, you know, we don't win every time, but I think getting people in and moving and writing is a good thing. The other thing that I'm very quick to point out to people in my first session is that, you know, the healing doesn't happen here. It happens outside the window. I just point out the window and, and they get that. So that's that's my first session, but in in the context of that, in the context of the first session, and in the context of a reluctance of a lot of non-indigenous psychologists, especially to to work in the indigenous space, you know, I always say to people, you know, I said, you know, you've got a first session with your client, your client comes in, sits down, you're wearing a blindfold, you don't know who your client is, you can't see your client which to me is very debilitating because I, I probably take more out of the connection between what is being said and how the body moves with that than anything else. But just go back to the, the original question that I always ask other practitioners. You know, you're sitting there with a blindfold, your first session is going along very well, there's engagement, there's rapport, it's all going the way you'd like it to go. Someone comes in halfway through the session and says, oh, you've got a blindfold on, we'll take that off. 
and you notice that your client is actually an Aboriginal woman. My question to everyone is, what would you do differently in the knowledge that your client is an Aboriginal woman? And if anyone can say, well, I need to do this because, I'd like you to think about why you think we need to do something different. If it's all going well, why do we change the recipe? Mm. So that's two parts, Mary. That's great, Jeff. I mean, I, I've we've had conversations around um, CBT derived strategies because um, that's <coughs> something that I teach GPs, and um, you know, there's been some discussion that maybe you can't do CBT based strategies with Indigenous people, but uh, I know that it's exactly what you just said. If it's working, just keep doing it. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd like to bring Marshall back in. Marshall, I imagine that some of the young people that you meet, it's actually under uh, really difficult circumstances for them. So they're either um, incarcerated in prison or they might be under the Mental Health Act. And so these issues around um, helping people to feel safe and, and, and engage must be even more difficult. I just wondered if you had any reflections on working in those kind of environments or meeting, particularly when you meet a client for the first time. Well, I mean, by well, the time, like, you know, it comes back to that principle that you've got to, you've got to assess the safety of the situation first and, you know, depending on what, you, what you're sort of dealing with in front of you, if someone's acutely, you know, heightened and distressed and threatening, you've actually got to de-escalate them and, you know, there's no... I don't know, maybe it's just the way that I do it, but it's about trying to really stop being a clinician and just start and just be a human, engage with people, have a conversation, you know, around issues of respect, you know, try and appreciate the space they're in, acknowledge the space they're in, that it's a crappy situation and just try and really de escalate it rather than try and going into things first. And that's the way that I sort of generally tend to do it. I mean there's no hard and fast rule to it, but it comes really down to being human, showing some respect, acknowledging that what's going on is, you know, and acknowledging the space that people are actually in. I'll stand, if people are standing up, I'll stand up until I've got a queue enough to, I feel it's safe enough to sit down. They may feel it's safe enough to sit down, and once they sit down, yeah, they're still agitated, but it's still treating them, you know, like a human being and having a general chat, not actually dealing with the acute reason why they're in hospital, probably talking more around issues of what's going on for them, what's going on in their family, and just try and really de-escalate and talk around things rather than going straight for the you know, acute risk assessment or acute issue because they're not ready to actually go there then. But again, I mean, I could count on my hand the number of times that I've felt unsafe in you know, 10 or so years, and it's been probably in an emergency department in the middle of the night, people, you know, um, working with kids in custody, it's actually a very safe space to be working and before going into talking to someone, you always gather the info you need to about the safety and what's going on for that person. If someone's too upset and distressed, then you have to walk away and leave for a bit. But in order that you don't leave the person there, you work with the staff there around how you're actually going to de-escalate them because you don't want people sitting there in a heightened distressed state. It doesn't actually do them any favours and it's a, you, you can't actually do anything like that. Mm. Um, and I, I wondered also, so I mean one of the things that happens when, when um, we identify a, a, a risk of suicide that we're really concerned about, um, you know, in, in many states and in some professions we, we have to consider the Mental Health Act. I, I just wonder if there's any, you know, sometimes the, we might, um, you know, keep someone in a particular environment um, for assessment or, or then for their safety but that environment might be itself traumatising or not therapeutic. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, I work with, I come across young people who live with chronic suicidal ideation. They don't end up staying in hospital. I mean, if we look at the classic example of a young person with complex trauma who's been exposed, primed and normalised sort of, sort of for hypervigilance and like Lewis was saying, that defensive stance, that's all really overwhelming. They don't have any self-regulation and people defer to self-harm and suicide. Suicidal ideation is a way of trying to get out of the situation they're actually in. And that's a really hard space to be sitting in. Now, um, I think the thing, maybe I'm just a bit sort of desensitised to risk, but I deal with risk every day, whether it be suicide or violence or this, that or the other. But it really comes down to, okay, if someone's got suicidal ideation, 
not to get too reactive about it, it's to really, again, sit in the space and explore what it's actually about. What's the acuity? What's the intent? What's the mechanism? But, you know, so that's the risk side. But then it's about, well, what are the protective factors? Where are the resilience factors here? People have been assessed to death by uh, about being dangerous, but it's, I think we need to start looking at the strengths. And, you know, in those situations, it's looking at, okay, what are the supports? What are the strengths? Okay, yeah, you've got self-harm or suicide ideation. What does that actually mean? And the question I always ask people is, you know, one, okay, you get those thoughts. Does that happen when you're feeling relaxed or stressed? If they say it's when they're stressed, then I know that's an issue around sort of emotional regulation at times of duress and poor coping strategies. So it's about working with that. Whether if it's all the time, then it's a bit of a different thing because it's, you know, sometimes it's situation and sometimes it's not. Um, and then it's being... As in anything with this, it's about being curious and exploring about what are you going to do to really, at this point in time, alleviate distress to ameliorate risk. And by and large, we don't always have to admit people to hospital with suicidal ideation. However, there are situations where it's a little bit more tricky. That is, if there's issues of intoxication, the home environment's unsafe, there's been a chronic problem with an acute exacerbation, and then you're right, we put, people, we put people into hospitals to give them a break and reduce the risk, but hospitals can be a very traumatising environment. I mean, I think with a lot of kids that I see, there's this construct of safety and chaos. They've, they've come from, they live such a chaotic, normalised existence that when you put them in a hospital, it's sterile, it's quiet, there are, there are people that are trying to, you know, sort of help them and so forth. And that's a very foreign thing which can be incredibly alienating. So, you know, the classic example of the chronic and suicidal person is someone with a borderline personality construct. And when they're in crisis, it's not necessarily possible that it's the best place for them because sometimes it's actually being at home with their own family and supports. I think the thing about suicidal ideation is not to shy away from it or get nervous about it. Yeah, we've got to recognise it, we've got to deal with it. But I think as clinicians, we actually have to be able to be comfortable to be about curious with risk and learning how to sit with it. I'm not saying that we have to carry risk and have sleepless nights, but it's about in order to really make a good idea of risk, what people say and what they do is one thing, but what are the contextual factors? So a fairly long-winded answer, but I think it sort of highlights the fact that it's so, you know, it's about being comfortable in, you know, talking about risk and then that also helps to ameliorate it and hospitals aren't always the best people, the best places for people if, if they're suicidal. Sometimes it makes it worse. Yeah. And I suppose, I mean, a big thing that you, that you talked about there is you, because you deal with risk every day, you've kind of got used to it. So it probably doesn't make you quite as anxious as oh, it might I get... make some clinicians. <laughs> and and I suppose it's okay. about... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, well, we, we, we have to find ways of, like, we don't want to do coercive things to people because we feel anxious, and sometimes we don't think so clearly when we're anxious. So, But that's where you get help, and that's where you kind of, I mean, I guess for me, I think the thing is, if you're in that situation and, you know, you've got someone distressed in front of you and that's making you distressed, the transference, the counter-transference are playing out, then you've got to sort of sit and go, okay, sometimes it's okay just to step out, get a have a think about it, get some advice from a colleague about what to do and then put other structures in place. Because in order to look after someone, you've got to look after yourself, you've got to manage your own anxiety about things. And it's completely understandable to get anxious about this sort of stuff. Mm, absolutely. I'd like to invite Lewis back in. Lewis, this question is just out of the blue for you, but um, it's come up in the, um, the participant questions. I, and I, I suppose I'm just asked, like a lot of... Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clinicians navigate this kind of complex world where um, everybody expects things of them. And like, and I know all of, all three of you have been involved, you know, in politics and leadership and advising government and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure that on a personal level, um, you get, you know, asked stuff by friends and family all the time. So just, Lewis, how can how can we support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, and is there anything that you wanted to say about that, just to recognise that complexity for those people? Um, I suppose very simply, it, it's just being a little bit mindful um, of the uh, that by by nature of who this person is, 
there will be a lot of calls on them. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, there's a, so there's, sorry, there's a term here in Queensland, uh, Ab Aboriginal people in Queensland refer to ourselves as, as Murrays. And so, um, so you, um, you might, you might hear about somebody being the MBE in the family, um, which isn't the, um, you know, middle of the British Empire. That's Murray being educated. Um, uh, or, you know, in the southern states, they, they, you know, they're not knights of the British Empire, they're Koori being educated. Um, and so if you're, that, if you're that person who has um, uh, a, a little bit more experience of living between the two worlds, um, um, then, then you'll often be called on um, uh, in, a role, in some sort of translator role um, um, to help um, the, the two groups of people not being able to, um, uh, to, to figure out what's going on. And, and it does get incredibly taxing at times. Um, and certainly, with uh, in the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, um, we we we're frequently hearing the stories of young people um, who are going through the, through exactly this, even while they're in medical school. You know that young Aboriginal person who managed to get into medical school. Um, um, that's that's that kid in the family with with great promise. Um, and so the you know the amount of these kids who are taking time out of their their, their medical school years to go back home and fix things is, is extraordinary. And, but I think you'll find that that's also true throughout um, the, the community of, of Indigenous health professionals, that, that whoever you are and, and whatever level you're at, um, you know, if you're an Indigenous hospital administrator, um, you're going to have a skill set that gets called on frequently, um, um, even though, you know, you might, have done, you might have done a degree in accountancy, um, but you're still going to get called on to be some sort of cultural translator um, on a frequent basis. Um, and I suppose for a lot of us, um, we we do it because we know that we have to do it, and that's just and that's what it is. Um, um, uh, but but if people are able to just from time to time show some appreciation um, for the fact that that we don't get to just go home and, and let go of it at the end of the day, um, then uh, then I think it makes the experience a little a little easier. Well, one of the things that I used to say frequently in, in cultural awareness programs to, uh, to doctors is um, one of the things that I do find a, a, a little funny at times though is, is how much similarity um, Aboriginal people have um, uh, with, with doctors. Um, we both come from cultures um, which are extremely hierarchical and, um, and in an Aboriginal community I would make sure that I never openly disrespect a, an, an elder. If I disagree with an elder I would do so in, in a way that's, that's quiet and gentle in the background. And, and preserves their dignity. And in medicine, you'll see young trainees do this in front of a consultant that does the same thing, that they won't openly defy the, the consultant. Um, we're both uh, groups of people um, um, who, uh, if somebody from the outside comes in to attack us, we'll circle the wagons and look after that person um, um, who's a member of our club. You know, it's true for Aborigines, it's true for, the, for, for doctors. And the other extraordinary thing is that um, both groups that I belong to have extraordinary levels of substance abuse, and that substance abuse relates to the chronic and unrelenting grief. The slight difference is for Aboriginal people um, that grief is frequently um, very personal and connected within your family, um, and for a lot of doctors, um, um, that, that grief tends a little bit more to be other people's grief. Um, uh, but, the, but there's that, that thing of come, that in, in my own profession, I know one of the things that makes, makes life so much easier for me is having a bunch of colleagues who do have an insight into my world. Um, uh, even even those who, who would tell you that they don't know an awful lot about Aboriginal people, um, um, it doesn't take long for us to talk for them to get an insight into my world and for me to derive an extraordinary amount of support from my colleagues. Um, yeah. Thanks for that, Lewis. And I, mu I must say that actually I've been very fortunate who have met you, but and I and I um, know Jeff quite well. We have a lot of shared clients, and um, I think I've learned a lot through working with both of you and friendship too. Um, Jeff, I think one of the things that's really tricky in in rural and regional and remote areas, it, we might want to collaborate with people, but there's no one there to collaborate with. And I know that's something that you've been thinking about. You know, how do we actually get people to to feel comfortable to work in this space or what what are your thoughts around that 
Um, there's a few actually, and um, it's probably very relevant today with what's been going on for me over the last week. Um, generally speaking, you know, with the, and I speak from within the psychology world, and I don't try to speak for anyone else, but generally, you know, we have a Indigenous Psychologists Association, um, and I, I think our numbers are getting close to the three figures, or might just surpassed it. But um, probably for me, with my clear focus on being very good clinically and, and working with, you know, I think sometimes clients that no one else is going to actually see. Um, many of our psychologists sit in big universities and in other more corporate spaces and, and good luck to them. Um, they're getting well remunerated but I just sometimes get quite frustrated and I did a talk at UQ last year saying, can you just leave us alone? Can you just let our own mob work with people clinically for a while before you take them into the the, the great halls of universities. Um, so if we assume that there aren't that many um, Indigenous psychologists working on the ground, we need non-Indigenous psychologists to pick up the speed now, uh, pick up the slack. Now, there's no shortage of trauma specialists in Australia, um, but I don't see many of them working in that space, um, which, you know, it's really, really difficult. We, or I, we just advertise for psychologists to work with some very difficult schools um, and advertise nationally and there's been zero response. Not even one person that's actually rung up or emailed or... And so that's the frustration. But when it comes to collaborating across disciplines, you know, I mean, as Mary said, we work very closely together. So the great thing about Mary is, um, you know, Mary is a GP and also a psychotherapist, so there's a different level of understanding. So I can call on Mary, but also, I mean, I get supervision from the central coast of New South Wales. I get I get supervision from England through Skype. Um, there's not much going on here. So as far as us developing a workforce that can actually deal with some fairly complex kids that we have a chance of actually turning around early, um, sometimes it's very, very difficult because you don't know who to call on. And when you do, there's this concern that they may not be good enough or that their peers might sort of, you know, frown on them for, for being in the space. And I've seen that so many times. So we do it. We, we do handle risk. We, we, when we work in small places, we don't have the, the big support systems that sit around us that help us when we've got um, suicidal clients um, and we have to take that on the chin. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult and at times it's very, very hard but you know, we do our best and you know, maybe one day we'll get all of our own Indigenous psychologists working in the field and, and a huge bevy of great non-Indigenous mental health clinicians standing beside us. Mm -hmm. It's a dream. <laughs> Marshall, I'd, I'd like to invite you back in. Um, I know, so I, what I'm interested in is I, I, I really like the social and emotional well-being model as a way of thinking, and I, I find it really applicable for, for everybody, not just for Indigenous people. Um, and I wonder if, if you've got any, somebody in the audience asked about um, how, how can we get collaboration between the services that kind of, operate under that model so that perhaps our Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have social and emotional wellbeing teams. Um, how can we collaborate with the more kind of quote unquote mainstream services like the state based health services or general practice? Do you, have you got any experience with that or any sort of thoughts about how that, that can work? Those two different kind of paradigms almost? Well, I think it comes down to respect and respect of different forms of knowledge and expertise. You know, the, the, the thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, I think that we, we need to appreciate that the social and emotional wellbeing services that we have in community controlled organisations are incredibly valuable. That represent an incredibly um, high skill set. And I'm talking, I guess, culturally here. 
in our Aboriginal mental health consultants that we have uh, actually have a, a vast amount of knowledge that probably doesn't always get translated across um, in the way of value to sort of mainstream services the way where people are kind of you know working in sort of very very structured teams um, and at the end of the day what we I think it's you know that there certainly needs to be collaboration and part of that is about having the discussion about you know who's doing what how they're doing and what they're actually trying to achieve I know that uh, sometimes there's reluctance by mainstream services for the to, you know for use of a better term to really look at the sort of the grassroots clinicians and how they're doing stuff and it's actually incredibly quite valuable and I think it's quite I don't think that people don't want to address the issue or don't but they probably struggle with how to actually do it and what they actually do need to do is actually think about well if we keep doing the same we're going to get the same so let's try something a little bit different I mean you know uh, speaking about where I work at the moment our team is 50% Indigenous we have a psychiatrist, you know, we have um, non-Indigenous and Indigenous workers and the skill set ranges from social work to mental health consultant, mental health nurse and there's just collegiate respect across the board. So it's just about how people sort of communicate with each other and respect their own backgrounds and knowledge bases and it's not about feeling threatened or, and if there's issues of, you know, what I, and this whole other issue around things like lateral violence, you need to call that for what it is. So I don't think it's just between services, it's certainly across the board and uh, the thing that keeps going back to me is about respect and you know, validating people and their experiences and, and what they actually have to bring. None of us are smarter than the other at the end of the day. It's just about how we see the world and how we do our job. Yeah, it, it makes me think about what Lewis was talking about with, with the hierarchies in medicine and the power differentials yeah. and, and I, you must have seen so many parallels. And I, I also was thinking that you know, what you're describing between the professionals in the team is the same kind of stance that we need to have towards our clients as well, that shared humanity and that respect. Um, so it's almost like that parallel process. Um, yep. Marshall, we're just um, coming to the end of the time and I'm just going to ask each of you if there's a, just a couple of things that you, that you wanted to say in reflecting on the conversation tonight that you'd like to leave the audience with. So you can go first. Look, I think at the end of the day, it's about when you're working with anyone, Aboriginal people, be human, treat them like you would treat any other person, in, you know, who you have respect for. Because you know, people have come to you, and you have the privilege of actually having to hear, of hearing their story and trying to help out. And be curious. Um, uh, you know, don't don't sort of shy away from things. We're not sure. Ask, but I think. The thing about trying to deal with tricky situations is be curious about, you know, the people that are sitting in front of you, but also the context of their lives and then trying to work through it with them rather than telling them what to do. Yeah. Or what to do and so forth. And I think by and large we do that, but I think curiosity is the thing that uh, sort of keeps coming back to my mind and also about respect for the person and the space that they're in and the fact they've come to see you. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, and the other thing is it makes your own job so much more interesting, doesn't it? Because oh, yeah, it does. Absolutely. human beings are endlessly fascinating and, and often um, I, I love listening to people. <laughs> it feels um, a great privilege. Thanks so much, Marshall. Um, Jeff, I wondered if you have anything that you'd like to kind of finish up with. You've got a couple of minutes. You don't have to hurry. Oh, awesome. Um, I suppose the big thing for me is you know, the, the my motivation for getting up every morning and and coming to work, and I'm always happy to come to work. Um, it's not because home's horrible, but um, I, I've said many times, you know, like the great thing about my job is everyone gives me something, they leave something behind, and if I ever find that I'm not feeling that or getting that, I realise that I'm off my game, and if I focus on going, well, what is this person actually teaching me or, or giving me in the process? Um, once I'm in that space, I truly believe that I'm working with my client. And, you know, it's, as Marshall said, it's an incredible privilege um, to be doing that. You know, we, if you're working in this space and you're not working for the, the larger organisation, if you want to charge a gap between what Medicare is going to give you, well, 
you're not going to be getting anywhere near the people you need to work with. So what I don't get in you know, a $30, $40, $50 gap, I get in what I learn. So I think if everyone can take that away and realise that it's a very enriched environment, well then maybe we'll get more people doing what I do. Mm. Really um, a kind of gentle challenge there, Jeff. It's really helpful. And I, I mean, this theme about um, the human relationship has come up so much in the chat box as well and how difficult that can sometimes be when you work in organisations that are focused on keeping the computer happy or filling out risk assessment forms and in the middle you're trying to do something that's more human than otherwise. So we acknowledge that that can be a really difficult space. And Lewis, I'd like to um, to bring you in and um, I'd, I'd just love you to tell us another story. What's been coming to your mind? Um, Oh, actually, I, no, no, I'm sorry to disappoint you. No, no stories are really coming to mind. Um, 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 so but okay. I just, whatever you'd like to say, Lewis. Look, I, 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 I just entirely agree with uh, with those um, closing points that Marshall and, and Jeff have made. Um, and uh, you know, don't be frightened of dealing with with, with Aboriginal people. Um, um, it's it's not as you know, not as different as a lot of us like to like to pretend it is. Um, uh, the 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 keep in mind that the cultural gulf that we're asking you to cross is exactly the same cultural gulf that that the three of us cross all the time. Um, you know, when when Jeff or Marsha or I are, are dealing with, uh, with with white folk, then really you know it's it's exactly no different than if there's a white practitioner dealing with our folk. Um, um, that that gap is the same, that that cultural difference is the same, but it doesn't really get in the way and anywhere near as much as a lot of people think that it does. Um, and and you know once you just start getting through those the, those little bits of issues and and just start meeting that person and start dealing you know meeting them at their point of need um, and seeing what it is that you can that you can do to help them, um, um, you know it just keeps everything all nice and focused. Um, uh, the the uh, you know I I am incredibly grateful that I have had an, an, an extraordinarily fortunate life um, uh, in the world that I was born in um, uh, you know not actually truly being a citizen having a very variable right to vote um, being part of fauna and flora um, um, the privileges that came to me. And, and I think the thing, I suppose the, the one thing that I want to leave everybody with is when I look back at my life, I know that the, the thing, the extraordinary thing for me is I have been the beneficiary of the, of the generosity of a whole bunch of white folk who owed me nothing. Um, they were just good people who tried to do what they could to help, you know, one young Aboriginal kid uh, get his way through medical school. These guys stood beside me and helped me through. And, and that you know that I would have this huge amount to thank this this cadre of and I'm sorry to be sexist but the truth is it there's a cadre of largely old white men um, who through through nothing more than just wanting to do that which was right and being good and decent people um, gave me a world that I could never have imagined uh, that I could never have thought um, was possible um, and and you know so I would just beseech everybody on this uh, on this webinar. You know, please keep that in mind that uh, that you you can have an extraordinary positive input into the the life of that young Aboriginal person, um, and just you taking that bit of time to meet them as a person may be may just happen to be that thing, that one magic thing that day that that makes them realise that I have value, I have purpose, um, and and that might just be enough to give them a level of success that they could never have imagined. Lewis, thank you so much for that. I, I can't really say uh, anything else. It's so important. So I just want to thank the three of you immensely for this discussion. I feel really privileged to have been a part of it and um, I know that the audience have really, the feedback's outstanding. So, just to finish up the formalities, thank you everybody for your participation. We had up to about 660 people. 
and I know that a lot, what happens is a lot of people download it and watch it again later or for the first time. So, so in the end, there might be thousands of people watch this, which is great. So please make sure that you um, complete the exit survey before you log out and it will appear on your screen after the session closes. You will be sent a certificate of attendance for this webinar uh, if you were logged in for it um, within two weeks. Each participant will be sent a link to the online resources associated with the webinar and that will include the slides that um, Marshall had prepared. So we've got some webinars coming up. Um, supporting people living with borderline personality disorder is on Tuesday the 21st of March and um, supporting families of people living with dementia is on Wednesday the 3rd of May 2017. We have not invented a backwards time machine, I think that's just a typo. So if you're interested in either of those, please sign up at the um, mhpn.org.au website. And also remember that we have local networks. So the personal relationships are absolutely key and that is one thing that, you know, that's really why MHPN was set up and, and has really gone a long way to achieving that. So there are local networks all around Australia. You can see where they are on the link there and some of them have special interests as well. So if you've got any interest in... Um, those networks and the other online activities, just go to mhpn.org.au. Um, and before I close, I think it's really important that we also acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with and live with mental illness in the past um, and who continue to do so. Uh, and a lot of their experiences are also similar and I, I think what we've learned tonight will help us in our work with all of our clients and I hope also in looking after ourselves and our relationships with colleagues. So just, I can't really thank the uh, panellists enough tonight. I feel quite moved by it. So thank you everyone for your contribution and participation and um, we'll see you again. <laughs>